My father was a tireless advocate for the law. He was a criminal prosecutor. Some say ruthless, others say righteous. Yeah, I'm cut from the same cloth. I can't really remember who I was before I became a cop. It's my job to make bad things happen to bad people. What we feel now bridges the distance between bottomless grief and profound rage. He was my uncle, but he was also my friend. I urge the person who's responsible for this to come forward and give us some peace. To be gay, it did have a certain amount of danger to it, that lifestyle at that time. The building was full of people. It wasn't some random act. People knew more than they were saying. Would anybody do this? Why? My brother was my dearest, dearest friend. He understood me. He adored my children. The things that I think about that might have happened to my brother that day and that night, I think the biggest focus is his shock and pain and horror. I feel always the grief and I agree for what might have been. Can you tell me a little bit about Dave as a brother? He was my best friend. I could confide in him about anything or discuss anything. It's hard to believe this actually happened to such a wonderful person. These are people that have had so much pain, so much loss dealing with people that have lost someone through murder, how can you make it better? You can't. If there's new information or um, something in the news, we wonder if maybe there's a connection between this case of my uncle's and another murder. What we would like to do is to look further into the circumstances of uh, how and why David was taken. We're looking for your blessing, your permission to allow us to undertake that that journey, if you will, and Absolutely. bring you along. Absolutely. I've been a cop and a professor of criminology for years, and I've used that experience to assemble a squad of civilian subject matter experts. They must approach each case completely unbiased, to not box themselves into conventional thinking, to bring fresh eyes and new technologies to the table. Their job, and mine, is to investigate the coldest of cold cases, the murders that time forgot. David Buller, professor of fine arts at the University of Toronto, fourth homicide in the city of Toronto in 2001. David was openly gay and well known in the local gay community. Much respected by his students, who saw him as something of a luminary, an inspiration. David Buller was last seen approximately 1 p.m. on January 18th, 2001, entering an elevator here, the Connaught Building on the main campus of the University of Toronto. In this building on that day, there was a retirement party on the main floor with at least 150 guests attending. David had a 6.30 p.m. lecture scheduled that same night. The class assembled in anticipation for the lecture as usual. They were surprised to find that a typically punctual David Buller had not shown up. The next morning at 7 a.m., a faculty cleaning lady enters the office and finds David dead on the floor. A victim of multiple stab wounds, she promptly notifies the police. I mean, the university you think of as a safe haven, and to have something so dramatic and awful take place there would just be horrifying. 
Naturally, speculation arose as to who might have done this, who would be motivated to do such a thing, and take great risk in doing so. Are we dealing with a student? Are we dealing with an outsider? David's sister mentioned to me that there's a student who's been bothering a number of the professors. Are there any questions, first of all, with respect to the facts in this case? Was the office a very bloody mess, like a real mess? Yes. As one would think, yes. Was there a trail of blood leading out of his office? There was no evidence of blood in the corridor or anywhere else outside the office. And no footprints, though? No. In terms of the stabbing, Renee, the fact that he was stabbed seven times and there were no indicators of blood trails, what could, what could explain that? It depends on, you know, whether he was struggling or moving around after several wounds had been inflicted or whether he had already been subdued somehow, knocked out and then stabbed. So more information about the crime scene and about the condition of David's body when it was found will definitely be helpful. Was he found face down on his back? That should be amongst the coroner's notes. How much of the building was cordoned off in the initial investigation? The entire floor would have probably been the inner crime scene and the building would have been sealed off. If this was my uncle, I wouldn't stop until I turned every stone. I would search every avenue and try everything I could. There's a killer out there. I want to hear fresh ideas about Who's going to do what? Renee? I'd like to contact the coroner to try and get a copy of the autopsy report. Securing that autopsy report is going to be key. Antonella? I want to see if I can get a psychological profile of David Buller's killer. It's a place to start. Knowing that there's a cold case here and that we have time pressure, it creates a little bit of anxiety, I would say, because we don't have a lot of time. I'd like to visit the site. So just to recreate the crime scene as it was? Yeah. Don't try to mimic what the police have done. We'll approach this with the resourcefulness that you have. It's gonna require you staying on target. We talk about this as being another cold case. The reality is, I just met David's niece and his sister, and for them, this case has never been cold. They have remained vigilant in trying to find answers about what happened to David since the day he died. They're putting their trust in you to help them find those answers. David's murder is particularly disturbing when I picture it in my mind's eye. Seven times someone stabbed him. How could you have that much hatred towards another human being? Where did the killer go? How did the killer get there? How did they move so stealthily through a building with at least 150 people, one floor down at a retirement party? To me, there's just more questions than answers. One of the main challenges for the squad in looking into David Buller's murder is the fact that in speaking with David's family and friends, he seems to have led a compartmentalized life. He had his life as an artist, his life as a professor, and his life as a gay man. The question then is, did the killer come from one of these many lives that David led? Or was this just a random act of extreme violence? I'm on my way to meet David's niece, Karen. Since 2001, she's been continuously pushing for answers in the murder of her uncle. It's my opinion that her insights on this case are essential to our new investigation. Do you think that the sort of sensationalist reportage around David's murder may have influenced the police investigation? Yeah, I think it could have shaped the investigation early on. I think that the police were making assumptions based on the fact that David was gay, thinking, well, that person must have done something risky. That person must have put himself at risk. It seemed implausible that this could be a random crime, you know, and hate crimes so often are. In any cold case investigation, family theories about what may or may not have happened are important. They help guide investigators. In David's case, we need to figure out whether or not this was a random act of violence, a hate crime, or what's known as a personal cause homicide, meaning someone acted in order to carry out a specific objective. What makes sense in my mind is that the person who killed David was known to David, and that person was very familiar with the Connaught building and knew where to find David. So I think we should go and check out every floor. Look at the hallways, uh, the washrooms, exits and entrance points. This is a great wee building. 
The neo-Gothic architecture of One Spadina looks to me like something straight out of a horror flick. Knowing that a murder took place just adds to that creepy atmosphere. How badly do I want us to be inside of this building? Very. It's my hope that we're able to try to find this office for the first time. Just get a rough sense of how labyrinthine is the interior of this building. Ah, locked. Let's see if this one's open. One, two, three. So there's three floors. So there's the one entrance side. That was for deliveries, maybe. Another door there. So there's another door here. This is an exit only, I guess. Oh, that's just great. Asbestos removal in progress. They're making interior modifications. So our initial idea of quickly running in there, getting a sense of the location, it's a little bit more complicated now. To kill a man in his place of work in the middle of the day takes a certain kind of perpetrator. I'm meeting with Dr. Giorgio Lacqua to build a psychological profile of David Buller's killer. And given that he was murdered at his office versus his home, what can that tell us about the, the, the crime itself? Let's say there's somebody you don't want to see anymore, you're this grand old friend or somebody you don't want to interact anymore, you will not let this person come into your house. But if it's a public building, the door is open, probably would have been easier for this person to land back in after committing such high emotional crime. So this person is hiding in plain sight, as they would say. Th that's, I think, what we're seeing here. The person would have cleaned the scene. No DNA evidence was found. Would that have been done, I guess, immediately after the murder? There's a, an explosion of emotionality, and then a return to normality. At that point, the person recovered all his ability to think straight. And if there was anything that should be or could have been uh, put in order, it was done. What about the choice of weapon, Giorgio? What can that tell us? It's likely that there was some familiarity because the person was able to get very close to the personal space of the victim. If you want to kill somebody with a blade, you really have to be very close. The use of a knife can reveal a lot about a perpetrator. The act itself was intimate and emotional. It tells us that the person that murdered David likely knew him. Oh, I was a bit disappointed to see in going through David's autopsy report that where the injuries are supposed to be marked and charted, uh, that the injuries weren't actually transcribed there. Every medical examiner operates a little bit differently. Although the diagrams weren't used by the pathologist in David's case, he did provide detailed descriptions of each wound in terms of their location on the body, their depth, angle of entry, etc. I'm translating those descriptions into a visual representation and demonstrate visually the pattern of external stab wounds. It's really essential to view them in the context of the body so that we can determine the position of the victim relative to the perpetrator. It looks like we have transversely orientated complex gaping stab wound just above the nipple level. Six stab wounds to the anterior chest and one to the left back. So although there's only one wound, yeah. there are multiple tracks inside the body. We just can't see them. Wounds inflicted with a knife really are a dynamic event. To be able to see the angle of entry, the depth, it all comes together to build a picture of just how that interaction took place. So we have a total of four abrasions associated with the stab wounds on the chest. It seems as though we're looking for a weapon that will have a single blade, but the base of the handle where it connects would have had the ability to cause an abrasion at both ends. Understanding the sequence of blows and the position of David relative to the perpetrator when they were inflicted will really help us put together this picture of whether they're already in close proximity when the attack began and how it unfolded. Once we know what the internal track is like, then we'll be able to map more precisely what the position of the weapon was. So let's start with the first external wound. Towards the sternum, it didn't pierce very deep. 
so we actually have two tracks originating from this surface wound. Certainly the perpetrator used a lot of force, so perhaps their first blow was a, a hard one. The perpetrator delivered the blows in smooth, single action. He was able to penetrate the blade deep into David's body with really no resistance. Visualizing the arrangement of the stab wounds and realizing just how precisely they were placed makes me realize just how close the perpetrator had to get to David to inflict these wounds. He was likely standing right behind him. Priority task for the squad at this point is determining how and why David Bullard was attacked at his office. I've deployed Peter and Daniel to go down to the university, have a closer look at the crime scene. Ah, locked. We need to determine if David not only knew his killer, but if the killer knew the layout of this building. The issue with access to One Spadina is the contractor has taken over the site. Sincerely, the Office of Space Management. The last possible physical record of David Buller's case is in the process of being destroyed, and all I can do is walk by and kind of watch it day by day. I believe there have been conversations with a number of my staff on insurances would not allow this. Unfortunately, this request is not possible due to a number of challenges. Unfortunately, not possible, not allowed it. Not allowed it. Regards, University Planning, Design, and Construction. Hey, Mike. We just got back from One Spadina Crescent, and uh, it turns out that uh, it's actually closed for asbestos oh. removal. Until when? Actually, this building is going to be undergoing a uh, $50 million transformation um, until 2015. All right, so I want you to continue to make efforts to get access. This is obviously, when we're under a tight timeline, not good news, right? Better news next time, right? Fingers crossed. Not having access to the building is incredibly frustrating, especially because it's so pivotal in this investigation. We need to examine the crime scene to unravel and put together the pieces. If we can't get physical access, uh, the next best thing is going to be the blueprints for the building. I want to see those drawings and see them used in configuring a three-dimensional retroactive crime scene model. Map all the paths away okay. from David's office right. and uh, see where that gets us. Hoping to, first of all, get a feel for the culture and feel of the art faculty at the time. Hopefully, by speaking to students or faculty, I can try and tap into any rumors or gossip or just what people thought did happen. I got completely shut down at the university. Nobody would talk to me about this case, period. Uh, I've kind of hit brick walls. So I've decided I'm gonna go and uh, do what I do. I'm gonna go out and canvas a, a few areas near the university. Try and find somebody who knew him, may have had a beef with him or know someone that had a beef with David. I believe it was someone that knew him and I believe it was meticulously planned. I'm working on a, a case, a David Buller. I've spoken to him, but that's as far as it goes. I hope you solve it. I've been shut down completely. It's almost like this, this academic administrative wall. I feel like I've let the squad down to some degree because that's my thing, is getting people to talk. I'm used to getting results, and uh, uh, I've got nothing. Better understanding David's relationship with his students may prove to be a critical piece of information in determining whether or not his murder was what we call a personal cause homicide. We heard rumors that David was dealing with a disgruntled student, but we can't get anyone at the university to speak with us. So I'm going to meet with David's sister, find out what exactly she knows. I wanted to just ask some follow-up questions with respect to some of the facts and issue. Did he talk to you at all in passing about his classes that term? There was a certain amount of, of tension because there was a student 
at the school that had been threatening uh, some of the professors, and he was one of them. Later I learned that the student was walking around at the back of the class with a knife in his hand. And he was tense. This incident with the knife, was this in one of David's classes? Yes. Was he genuinely concerned for his safety? Yes. I know the police had an alibi for this angry student, but we need to go back. We need to have a second look, look at that same information again. Even though I'm getting stonewalled everywhere I turn in this case, uh, I just got to keep at it. Nose to the grindstone. Something's got to come out of it somehow. Hello. Oh, no, don't worry. It's cool. I'm not a cop. So you might be able to help me, possibly. January 2001, at the Connaught Building, right here at Spadina Circle, okay. Professor David Bullard stabbed seven times. You know, Don Davis, uh, her and his student. You know oh, what? you know a student? Yeah, Don is the professor's student. Does yes, she come she here? Is. She will only sign there after doing here. Thank you so much. I'll see you then. A bit of a breakthrough here. Arranging to meet with someone uh, at 4 p.m. on Saturday that knew David at the time uh, of the murder. Finally, something. Based on scientific evidence and the civilian squad's own findings in consultation with experts, it appears very likely that David Buller knew his killer. We have conflicting information about the time of David's death. It turns out that he may have been threatened and even stalked during the final months and weeks of his life by someone known only as the angry student. The student was walking around at the back of the class with a knife in his hand. I need to get the squad on both of these new developments stat. All right, one of the names that keeps coming up, it's not necessarily a name as much as it, it is just a label, this angry student. Discounted by police. He was discounted by police. Well, I don't think that's any reason for us to discount him. He was eliminated in 2001 because of his being captured on CCTV inside a bank with a timestamp that was deemed to be accurate that would put him far enough away from the location of David's murder at the time of David's death. So, Mike, if we know the time that he was at the bank, do we also have an exact time when he was murdered? Renee, on the autopsy report? The autopsy report didn't indicate how the postmortem interval was determined, so I have no confidence that that particular time that was on the report is accurate. We already know that during the course of David's murder, during the struggle, the power cord for his computer was knocked from the wall. This created a time and date stamp on the computer's hard drive. Sometime between the final keystroke on that computer and when the power source was disconnected from the wall is when David died. And between those two events, both of which are recorded on the computer's hard drive, we have a fairly firm time of death. We're gonna compare the CCTV footage and the timestamp on that to the timestamp on David's computer. And from there, we can figure out if there is enough time between that time of death and when this angry student was last seen on the CCTV footage to get from that bank to the university. The computer is our best eyewitness. the bank where this person of interest started on CCTV at 1.07 p.m. He left this bank, and the question is, does his alibi hold up? So I'm going to start off my uh, stopwatch, and we can head out now. OK, perfect. We're going to one Spadina Crescent, the Connaught Building. This goes to Warden Station, right? Yes. OK. If it takes longer than one hour and 22 minutes to get to one Spadina, then his alibi holds.
know that uh, this student left that bank uh, at 107. Right. And so that gives an hour and 22 minutes. There we go. So we've beaten that by a good amount. We just discovered that we cannot discount this student based on his CCTV time alone because we can very easily travel, you know, on a weekday afternoon from that bank to the building's front door in about 45 minutes, no problem. I'm meeting a woman named Dawn, who is a student of David Buller's. What interested me about Dawn, first and foremost, is she was actually willing to speak to me because we'd had a lot of problems on campus uh, getting anyone who is a student or faculty member to speak to us whatsoever. Don, how did you know David? I had him for a full year, first year art studio. He was very easy to be around, very helpful, very accessible if you needed anything. Okay. But he always had that professional distance. Were there any rumors right off the hop about who may have done it? Somebody off the street, maybe a crackhead somehow came in, got into the right. office. Any indication towards him dating or seeing students socially? No, absolutely at all? not. Not, not no. at all, eh? And I never saw anybody that could be like a, a friend or a lover or whatever come to see him at class. Never either. nothing like that? No. What about the other uh, faculty members? As far as you know, did he get along with them or was there any professional beefs or anything like that you ever heard of? Rumors uh, of. I, I wouldn't say they seemed exceptionally friendly with each other. Well, we've been having uh, a lot of trouble getting faculty and students to talk to us about this case. Well, I would think if there's students that know something that they might, you know, like be afraid of a repercussion. And staff, I would think, they just want it to go away. Mm -hmm. It just looks bad. In this case, for the students or staff not to want to say anything at all, there's got to be a compelling reason there. It makes you wonder, could the killer still be in the building? They want it to go away, and I bet they want you to go away. No question that David knew his killer, and the angry student is looking like a viable person of interest. In order to firm up his alibi and also establish a precise or near precise time of death, I'm going to have Peter conduct a forensic computer analysis of David's files. The end of activity on that computer should indicate the time of death and will also help us confirm whether or not the student had enough time to get from point A to point B and commit this murder. The more I delve into uh, the details, the more I'm struck by how the criminals uh, managed to pull this off, how they're still out there, how there's no answers. Coming from physical sciences, I'm a fan of getting answers. What's going on here? I see a uh, kind of a retro desktop here. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, here we have an iMac, very similar to what David uh, would have used in his office. I talked with Lisa Sandloss. She tells me that his original machine has been disposed of. She was able to give me, though, these uh, screenshots of the original forensic investigation. The reason I wanted to get my hands on this is this discrepancy in the times here. The last written time recorded on the file is 2.10 p.m., but the log contents themselves begin with the correct date and then 1.10 p.m. What would account for the discrepancy, do you think? Um, well, the only way I could explain this discrepancy would be to hypothesize that David was in the habit of leaving daylight saving time turned on. That advances the displayed time by one hour. Because this one hour is important in terms of establishing time of death and um, firming up the quote unquote angry student's alibi. Whether his computer was set to daylight standard time or daylight savings time, that one hour difference could change everything. We need to firm up when exactly that final keystroke was. That indicates roughly the time of death. The squad's been trying to track down former students of David's for weeks. Finally, Antonella has located a former student. The student is speaking to us on the condition that her identity remain a secret. Did David have more collegial relationships with other faculty? I have to say no. 
I also detected some kind of like uh, political jousting going on like right before the end because um, you know there has to be a head of department and I felt like someone was putting um, David forward for that and there were other people who disagreed with his politics. Who interests you in terms of this case? They really should be looking at faculty and someone in particular. Not only is Peter working on solving this time of death mystery, but he and Danny are using technology to grant us access to the building. If we can't get in, we'll just rebuild the building virtually and see what we can glean from that model. So here we're following the point of view of someone unfamiliar with the building. Right? So they'd look back and forth, they'd have to navigate through these 150 people. I can't wait to see what the squad will do with this. Here we have the main entrance. Where would David's office have been? Yep. So Renee, which side of the Crescent was the crosswalk on? We need to prove whether or not David's killer knew his way around the building, and more specifically, knew his way to David's actual office. This is great that we've got the drawings. Danny and I have some 3D models up on the smart board. All right, let's have a look. I wanted to just have a look at those. We've taken these technical drawings, and we've recreated three-dimensional uh, models of the first and second floors. OK. So what we're seeing here is the path of someone unfamiliar with the interior entering the building and encountering this crowd of 150-plus people. These are the guests at the retirement, retirement party. party. Yeah. OK, great. So here we ascend to the main staircase, and we try to make our way to David's office. Unfortunately for this assailant, he quickly gets lost in the labyrinthine passageways. And finally, this uh, unfamiliar person happens upon David's office. It's Fall. not an intuitive route to his office, based on Absolutely. the animation scheme I'm seeing and where it's located. We've also examined numerous escape routes. And each one is more complicated than the next, especially given that David's office was located on the second floor. In the next animation, we have a much more direct route. Here we're simulating what somebody familiar with this building might have done to get to, to David's office. They know exactly where they're going. And they make their way to the second floor. Up the main staircase. So two rights, end of the hall. And then there's David's office. So that's what the route would look like. This strongly suggests premeditation or familiarity with the building. You know, the middle of the daytime, with that many people in the building, to get in and out, uh, very bold, calculating for certain. Someone who was, was clever. Maybe the person was already in the building in the morning, had been there for a couple of hours. The additional question is then the exit route. Yes, so and we, we have that as well. Slide. Excellent. We're looking at the second floor here. The blue square is David's office. Green right. are the elevators. If you look at these possible exit routes, there is no blood transfer. We already know from examining the blueprints that there were bathrooms located near David's office, that there was art studios located nearby. Studios like bathrooms have sinks. This may in part explain why no trace evidence like blood was found near the murder scene. So you're talking about someone who not only was familiar going in, but then exiting was discreet enough and careful enough to not leave any transfer evidence anywhere along this entire expanse. Somebody had time to um, perhaps change into different clothes. I think Danny is bang on here. I think we're looking for someone who was already in the building. In fact, someone we could describe as belonging to the building. Someone who didn't have to run and hide, either before or after David's murder. To be able to escape without leaving any evidence behind, no signs of of blood spatter. There are some very deliberate steps that were taken by the perpetrator to cover their tracks. All possible explanations lead back to Peter's hypothesis that we're talking about someone who knows the layout of the building and is a familiar user of the building. Right from the beginning in this case, I was looking for answers. Finally getting some of those, it's an amazing feeling just to know that we can reconstruct what happened. So it just it feels, it feels great. The more we look into this, the clearer things get. The placement of the wounds on David's body suggests he may have known his killer. 
the location of his office and the lack of any blood or transfer evidence in the corridor outside the office also suggests that the killer knew the layout of the building. So that, plus what our witness is telling us, suggests that we should be looking at someone within the building itself. It could be a spurned lover, could be someone from the faculty or staff. Peter and Daniel threw their 3D model to simulate the killer's movements within the building. That builds a compelling case that David's murder was not a random act of violence. It would seem that it was in fact premeditated and likely committed by someone from within the university itself. That said, we don't have any concrete leads as to who this person was. At this point, it's key that we find someone who knows something and is willing to talk. Going to the art gallery to interview David's friend, Andrew Ward. Andrew. Mike. Nice meeting you. David's family describes you as one of his closest friends. So I guess my first question is, as someone who would be maybe a confidant of his, is this a suggestion that David led something of a double life? There is some misinformation about him floating around out there. Well, right I think there were, there were people close to the police at the very beginning of the investigation that could have clouded David's personality. Okay, how so? You know, the police were always coming to me and asking me these ridiculous questions. Like? And, well, you know, did David ever see any of his students? Okay. No. He knew there were lines you just didn't cross. So some of the reports, a late night tryst gone awry or something like that. Fiction. Okay. Around Christmas 2000, so just a few weeks uh, before David's murder, mm -hmm. he made some suggestion that he felt that he may be in danger. Did he ever come to you with concerns about this rogue student? Is the student someone of interest in this case? No. No, not at all. Okay. No, no. Why? Well, I think it's all university related for sure. I think um, there are other people at the university that raised a lot of red flags. Who are these people? Um, well, and just before he was killed, he stated to me that he had problems with both these faculty members. David's murder immediately gave rise to a number of theories among his friends and family, each of whom obviously has their own bias point of view. At this point in our investigative analysis, it's crucial that the squad not focus on theories or get hung up on conjecture and focus on cold, hard facts. So we're at the end. So I'd just like to hear your final findings. On that day, there was a field trip planned for students on the second floor, which is where David's office was. So the second floor cleared out. That rules out anyone interrupting the killer. Yeah, that can't be deemed a coincidence. It's a fascinating find, so thanks for that. Renee? I did have an opportunity to review crime scene photographs and combined with the results of my experiment, confirm uh, that David was likely stabbed from behind. That was likely the first blow. I've learned really to control the emotional response to what are otherwise very visceral and dramatic scenes. The ultimate goal of all of my analysis is to provide some answers for the family. The perpetrator was likely standing directly behind him. Um, and my best guess is that they were looking at the computer screen together uh, when he was surprised by the wound to his back, the momentum of which likely tipped him backwards. So this is someone he trusted enough to not only get that close, but turn his back to. Peter? So I put a lot of time into resolving the one-time discrepancy that I found in these uh, reports. And uh, the computer was set to Eastern Standard Time, putting the last action recorded on the computer at 2.25 p.m. When I examined David's computer logs further, I discovered that he continued to work until approximately 2.25 p.m., giving the angry student plenty of time to leave the bank at 1.07 p.m. and make the 45-minute journey to David's office. These findings are compelling, and I think uh, we've got enough here to put together a final report, and I'm prepared to deliver 
those findings to David's family. We've hit a brick wall with our own investigation, so it's crucial that we share all of our findings with the police as well as the family. David's murder does fit within the model of what we call personal cause homicide. One of the people you all mentioned early on during the course of my meeting with you was this angry student. Yes. And no one was really satisfied that he could be excluded in terms of opportunity. There was sufficient time from his being on the CCTV image at the bank to when we now know David was murdered. We know that he withdrew or was in the process of already withdrawing from the university at the time and that he left the country shortly thereafter. However, we spoke with several students, but I can tell you people are very afraid. Their fear and reluctance suggests that there is still someone who wields some degree of power such that they are deterred from saying anything. There is compelling evidence this person was familiar with the building, somebody with uh, direct access and knowledge of David's whereabouts and routine. The methodology we use and the rationale behind what we're doing is your best suspects are the ones left standing once other people are excluded. In brief, there is a strong possibility that it was a faculty member in the arts department at the university in 2001 who was David's killer. I just feel a tremendous sense of relief. Yeah, I do too. Um, but. And I feel very um, emotional right now because this is what we've wanted was this kind of exhaustive search. If your theory is true, he didn't die because he was gay. And that is a big deal to me. And he could have, that could have been the answer, but we should have been looking at everything more closely. Thank you, thank you very much. My father was a tireless advocate for the law. He was a criminal prosecutor. Some say ruthless, others say righteous. Yeah, I'm cut from the same cloth. I can't really remember who I was before I became a cop. It's my job to make bad things happen to bad people. did not want to go to work that night. He did not walk the streets at night. We all knew as soon as Jackie didn't come home that something was wrong. The overpass was Jackie's last walk.
Jackie deserves that someone be held accountable for this. Every time I come here, I recall Jackie's last walk. My mother was devastated. All that she wanted to do was look for Jackie's killer. We would follow any tips. We kept poking and looking. Someone decided to end Jackie's life and take her away from us. How has it been for you, this experience, losing Jackie? I've lost other people in my life from illnesses, old age, and you can intellectually process it while you're grieving. In Jackie's case, you can't. The grieving has been done, but there are no answers. Having something hanging for so many years and not knowing the answer, I would think it wears you down a bit because you've lost something so precious so early. I don't know if there's such a thing as closure, but I know for me that I would rather know who's responsible than live all my life not trying to find answers. When I met with police last year, I had three requests, one of them being if Jackie's diary could be returned to us. That's the only thing I have, and I'm willing to offer it if that would help. It will help. We will take that. Thank you. The exhibit tag shows 1969, October 4th, at 15 minutes after 10 o'clock p.m. That may have been the last time it was looked at. Having the diary in my hand as an artifact of Jackie's short life hammers home the importance of what we're doing here. With your blessing, we would like to bring this case back into the light. I believe it is solvable. Being from London, I always knew about this case. Everyone here has a personal connection to this case and should be angered that it's still open. I've been a cop and a professor of criminology for years, and I've used that experience to assemble a squad of civilian subject matter experts. They must approach each case completely unbiased, to not box themselves into conventional thinking, to bring fresh eyes and new technologies to the table. Their job, and mine, is to investigate the coldest of cold cases, the murders that time forgot. Jacqueline English, case number 69-52. The 52nd murder in the province in 1969. October 4th, 1969, approximately 5 p.m. Jacqueline, or Jackie as she was known, attends her place of work here. The Metropolitan Store, located in the Treasure Island Plaza, was then a rural area outside the city of London. Jackie was a waitress at the Metropolitan Store. 10.15 p.m., Jackie is seen leaving the store walking over the overpass on Wellington Road. Two witnesses describe Jackie as getting into a four-door sedan. That's the last time Jackie is seen alive. Four days later, the nude body of Jackie English is discovered floating in the water of the Big Otter Creek near the town of Tilsonburg, almost an hour outside the city of London. No clothing on the body. Even her earrings had been removed. It's determined that Jackie died from a single severe blow to the head. Young girls like Jacqueline, to have her life cut short in such a violent and atrocious manner, it's, it's horrifying. I have a 14-year-old daughter. Just disturbing as a parent, it's, uh, it's evil. The fact that it was so long ago and it hasn't been resolved, and the fact that only Anne is left a sister. The length of the not knowing, is, it's tragic. A number of Jackie's belongings, including torn pieces of her clothing, are found approximately 10 miles from where the body was dumped. A pair of brown penny loafers she was seen wearing as she was walking home were found 10 miles from where the other clothing was discarded. A witness comes forward, a woman named Betty Harrison. She tells the police she saw Jackie speaking with a customer inside the Metropolitan store, a man she describes as having made Jackie look uneasy. 
She provides police with a description that allows them to create this composite drawing. Ms. Harrison begins to receive threatening phone calls, telling her she should not have gone to the police. In subsequent days, she receives a sympathy card in the mail. The only inscription on the card is the statement, we will be watching you. It also indicates to me that the perpetrator, they're very connected to the media. There seems to be almost an aspect of performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. About a month later, Ms. Harrison is ambushed by a man with a knife and confined in her car while he cuts her face upwards of 27 times. The attack on Mrs. Harrison seems very theatrical. If her attacker was legitimately concerned with being connected to Jackie's murder, why wouldn't he just kill her? Was Ms. Harrison able to describe her attacker and did it match the composite? Not very well. It was dark, and given the uh, brutality of the attack, she didn't get a good look. This uh, Ms. Harrison is still alive and willing to talk to us. She's dead. She's dead. It would have been very helpful to be able to speak to somebody who saw something at the time. So far, the squad is asking all the right questions. They're looking for a way into this case, and that's exactly what I want to see from them. Other questions that connect to the evidence. Was Jackie sexually assaulted? No obvious sign of sexual assault other than her body being stripped nude, her clothes being found torn. No defensive wounds? No defensive wounds. Her boyfriend at the time voluntarily provided a blood sample for comparison to the DNA at the scene because it was thought that the sample may have been from when they had consensual sex earlier on the 4th. What was the boyfriend doing on the night of the 4th? In the notes that I've received, and I'll share with you, uh, there's a detailed statement taken from the boyfriend. He has an alibi. OK. It's just weird that there wasn't necessarily a lot of trauma to her body, but the person who was threatened afterwards with the knife, there was substantial violence. So is it the same person? Is it a copycat? We know that there's a number of unsolved sex slangs in London at the time. Mike and I met with a sister who had mentioned that this person named Marilyn Hurd, a friend of Jackie's. After Jackie died, Marilyn tried to commit suicide. Marilyn had a picture of Jackie. And on the back of this picture, it said, the name of the killer will remain with me. Antonella's revelation raises a lot of questions for me about Marilyn, who she is, and what else she knows about the circumstances about Jackie's death. It could be huge. It could break the case if we can get her to come clean and talk to us. What do you want to do with this? I'd like to go to where the body was dumped. I think it'd be useful to map all of the different locations, because if we have the point where she was abducted, where the body and other clothing was dumped, it might give us a useful radius to start plotting persons of interest. I like where you're going with that. Geographic profiling is key in this case. Peter? I'd like to get a look at as much archival data as possible and map it. Maybe pair up with someone who then can look at similar cases. Mike, you mentioned that there's a lot of sex slangs in London, so I'd be interested in looking into those cases, public forums, that kind of thing. Antonella? I want to look at the diary, first of all. I want to see what's in the diary. I want to see what she thought, what she did. Monty? Marilyn, you'd have to go and uh, try and talk to Marilyn. Find her. There's still an element of danger to this case. Be mindful of who we're dealing with here. Stay vigilant. All right, let's go. Jackie's murder is a very complicated case, and it will push this squad to its limits. Not only do we have to unearth old facts, we need to uncover new information. 40 years is a long time for a case to be cold. I don't know whether or not Marilyn Hurd is alive, but somebody has to remember her. Jackie English was last seen alive on the night of October 4th, 1969, when she was on her way home from work. Her body was discovered in a creek days later over 40 miles from where she was last seen. Her clothes and shoes were then found miles from where her body was located. I need Antonella to look at our victim. I need her to help us understand who Jackie was. Why is it that she got in the car that night? Who was driving? Was it someone she knew, someone from her inner circle, a friend and acquaintance, or someone from an outer perimeter? Someone who had seen her before, and when they saw her walking that overpass, saw an opportunity and took it.
I came in this evening to really focus on reading Jackie's diary. I'm interested to see what Jackie was thinking at the time, what was going on in her life. There are thoughts, there are reflections that she's experiencing. I want to get to that. As a psychotherapist, you have to read more than what's actually there. After reading the diary several times, I noticed that there could be some code embedded in the text. Cracking this code might be key in helping us in this investigation. I've just got a call about some files and some personal diaries that belong to a detective who worked this case in the late 60s. I'm hoping that there's something buried in those files that will light a fire under this case. Dennis? Oh, Mike, nice to meet you. meet you. I found some interesting information. My father passed away, and he was a detective sergeant in this area. They spent a lot of time on this Jackie English case. And there's the diaries. I also found in his basement some files. Yeah, and you see these diaries. They tell what he did and who he met. Jackie English bothered him all his life because it never did come to resolution. This is a great gift. This is really remarkable. I've never seen anything like this. This original detective was so focused, so haunted by this case, that he duplicated all of his notes and then made secondary copies of some of his key files, boxed them up, and he kept them as a time capsule in his house. One day, he hoped that someone could carry on his work, that new technology would provide new momentum for his hunches that he could never follow up on and that no one would listen to him about. I just found something interesting in the notes from the original investigation. It turns out that Jackie's coworker, Marilyn Hurd, who attempted suicide in the days after Jackie's death, changed her version of events about what happened that October night, not once, not twice, but three times. Hi, Anne, it's Mike. I'd like to come talk to you. I'm just following up on some new information. It's about somebody you know. One of the nagging questions in this case is the behavior of Marilyn Hurd. What is the secret do you think that she has? I think Marilyn knows exactly what happened to Jackie. Marilyn has directed everybody in a million different ways. But Marilyn always was saving the ending for another day. Marilyn's mind has covered it up, or she's deliberately not sharing that with us. Your sister's murder touched off this behavior. Then. Yes. This botched suicide attempt. I believe Marilyn holds the key, and something happened the Friday night. He's related. He was starting his career as a criminal very early on. Do you know if he was out of jail at the time of Jackie's murder? I have no idea if, if in jail or free. We may be looking at someone who's fallen between the cracks. We need to look further into Marilyn's relative, specifically his criminal background, if this is the person that Marilyn is protecting. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So I want to know what he was up to at the time and whether or not he would have had motive and opportunity to abduct and murder Jackie. Uh, right now, I'm up to trying to find Marilyn Hurd, but uh, I haven't had any luck looking for her on the computer. So I'm uh, going to go old school. She's not listed in any current listing, but maybe a few years ago or 10 years ago, she had an address. There's definitely some phone numbers here for me to look into. If Marilyn Hurd is alive and in London, I'll find her. The squad is investigating the murder of Jackie English, who was murdered on her way home from her part-time job in October 1969. Suffice it to say, after 40 years, the trail is very cold. Antonella is looking through Jackie's old diary to see if there's something in there that can help the squad out. I noticed that there could be some code embedded in the text. 
In addition to that, Peter and Renee are conducting a geoprofiling experiment, looking at other cases that may be related to Jackie's. Geographic profiling is a way of taking into account multiple crimes in a crime series, and we're applying Rosmo's formula to the case of Jackie English because we have multiple data points to work with here. Rosmo's formula is a mathematical equation designed to find the most likely residence of a serial killer based on his crimes. Rosmo's formula is currently the gold standard in terms of geoprofiling. It helped net Canada's worst serial killer, Robert Picton, developed by an academic police officer like me. I started my geographic profile with only one point, Jackie English's home at the time when she was killed. The distance between the Metropolitan Store, the highway, and London city limit remain unchanged. And those variables will all be important factors to incorporate into the geographic profile that Peter's constructing. Right now, we're at the site where Jackie's body was discovered in Big Otter Creek. And I'm interested in examining the landscape around the bridge and around the creek where she was found to see what other options the perpetrator may have had for disposing of her body. I find it hard to believe that if the body were dropped from this height into water that shallow, they wouldn't show any signs of scraping the bottom. We can't assume that she was actually dropped from the bridge. Perhaps her body was carried down the bank and placed in the creek itself, which means that there could be some added significance to this body of water. Renee's confirmed locations where Jackie was last seen alive and where Jackie's body was found. Renee's emailed me these coordinates and I'm going to put them into my geographic profile and start to build a more complete picture. Dania has been researching murders that have occurred in and around the area where Jackie was killed. Once I get those details, I'll be able to put it all together and see if a pattern emerges indicating where the killer might have lived. I'm intrigued why the perpetrator would have selected the bridge itself as a location to dispose of her body. It's a very conspicuous spot. It would indicate to me that the perpetrator wants the victim to be found. When I was reading through Jackie English's diary, I discovered that certain parts of it were written in some sort of secret code. Those are the encryptions that were in the diary. Do you think you can do anything with those? I could really use Monty and Peter's help to help me crack it. This E has got to represent either an I or an A, because those are the only two words in the English language that can be in a sentence and just be one letter. We've got some double letters too, right? Like yeah. the double B at the beginning of the word. What can that be? Llama? Yeah. Like what other word in the English language begins with a double letter? I can't think of one other than llama. And we have what is likely a substitution cipher, which means that every letter has been replaced by exactly one other letter, and that this scheme doesn't change or evolve. If E equals I, let's say that's the case. If we go one, two, three, four. Once we figure out what scheme Jackie used to encode this text, we can then proceed character by character. OK, I got it. One, two, B equals L. One, two, in. If J equals D, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, you follow? Yeah, I think you got it. Yeah, so we've got L, L. Lloyd. Well, the name Lloyd fits that template. When I checked into Jackie's background, I found out she had a boyfriend named David. When I checked into his background, I found out he had a brother named Rick. And Rick's middle name is Lloyd. What's V going to be? R, right? R, Fr French. She missed the letter. Lloyd French kissed me. Lloyd French kissed me? Yeah. There's one down here as well. F, M was A, right? Mm hmm I faked tears. I faked tears. That's what I got. There's only two instances of that encryption, which for some well, reason she wanted to keep these two secret. Yeah. 
Lloyd French kissed me? This is unsettling. French kisses and fake tears? Who is this Lloyd? And could he somehow be connected to Jackie's murder? Contained in the original file for Jackie English is a letter dating to 1978, nine years after she was murdered. It's written by the brother of Jackie's boyfriend at the time of her murder. In this letter, Rick is seeking Dave's forgiveness for something horrible that he's done. The writer will not mention the event. Substitution words he uses include the burden, the sin, my sin. What he's referring to, I don't know. Could the brother, Rick, have had something to do with Jackie's murder? That's the question. The squad has been pushing hard to find the person or persons responsible for the murder of Jackie English. This is a group of civilians. Detective work is not in their usual wheelhouse. That said, so far I'm impressed with what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. It's imperative that we track down Jackie's co-worker, Marilyn Hurd, and look closer at her relative. I've been digging through some old police files, and I found an interesting letter between Jackie's boyfriend at the time and his brother. The content of that letter is strange, and it may have something to do with her murder. I'm recruiting the assistance of Dr. John Olson from the UK, arguably the world expert when it comes to forensic linguistics. He's been used by detectives all over Europe in cases where they need to analyze suicide letters, ransom letters, or confessions. In this case, I want him to get to the bottom of this concealed sin that's being referred to in this letter between the two brothers. If you'd just like to give me your take on the letter as it was given to you. One of the first things that I look at when I look at a document of this nature is to see whether I can somehow get a picture of the relationship between the writer and the receiver. I've removed the date, I've removed any reference to any specific person by name or by relationship. So he's looking at a blinded document. Upon reading this, it is clear that any relationship between the writer and the receiver of these documents goes back a very long way. But yet, there is no love lost between us. That made me think of siblings, that we are dealing with siblings. What, in your expert opinion, is it that the writer is talking about? I think the word sinfulness really gives us the clue. Uh, it, it strongly suggests to me a, a sexual incident. The very fact that it's never made overt, this is a very common strategy used by people when talking about incidents of which they feel some kind of shame. Now, there is a certain crypticness about it. This may be because the writer, it just occurred to me, uh, was uh, perhaps in prison at the time, but even so, there is no indication here of a third party. This seems to be very much a matter because of the intensity of it between the writer and, and, and the receiver. In your experience, is this thing that the writer is referring to a cryptic admission to a murder, in your opinion? No, absolutely not. I think this is a private shame that we're dealing with rather than a public crime. Dr. Olson, in analyzing this letter and knowing nothing else about this case, is satisfied that it's correspondence between two siblings and that it's in reference to some sexual incident and that it's not a confession to murder. In combing through the original lead detective's personal diaries and journals, I've noted that her boyfriend at the time, David had an alibi and was immediately excluded as a suspect. That said, his brother Rick has some significant involvement with the law. In looking at what he's done, nothing comes close to the very specific ammo and signature that we see in Jackie's murder. It's time we move on and explore other possibilities. When Mike talked to Jackie's sister, Anne, he found out that Marilyn Hurd's relative had some run-ins with the law. So I'm checking crime sites, social media sites, and any other records to see what I can come up with. See if there's any buzz about this guy still out there. Dania has found some compelling information 
about Marilyn's relative that might prove key in moving this case forward. We have uncovered a very interesting development. Of course, we all know Marilyn Hurd. This botched suicide attempt in the weeks after Jackie's murder revealed that she had a photograph of Jackie in her pocket with some sort of cryptic, ominous message that she would take the secret of the killer to her grave. And who is it that Marilyn would be so willing to protect? And it turns out that Marilyn has a relative. And in 19... He stabbed and slashed a boy playing on a lawn. He was later arrested, charged, and convicted in this attack. He was paroled or on full release just before Jackie's murder. We need to determine whether he and Jackie ever made acquaintance. I was also able to obtain a high school class photograph. This is him here. Did he also slash Betty Harrison? The witness who provided police with that composite description. If so, is he also more directly connected to Jackie's murder? So we're gonna need to tighten this up. Renee, I want you to look further into what happened. And I want you to track down an expert in facial recognition who can overlay and compare this image from 19... to the 1969 composite drawing. These are important finds with limited time remaining. Let's get at it. The missing piece of the puzzle continues to be Marilyn Hurt. Whatever it is she knows or thinks she knows is key here, so finding her is imperative. Residential. Gotcha. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, it's Monty. How are you? Yeah, I found Marilyn Heard. In London. I'll email it to you right now. Finally, this is our opportunity to find out if Marilyn Heard really knows something. Is she protecting her relative? I know who they are. Who are they? The squad is looking to help solve the 1969 murder of Jackie English. She was last seen getting into a car and then vanishing into the night. We already have one suspect. She had a relative who, just prior to Jackie's murder, was convicted of a serious assault. It seems as though she may be protecting him. Tell me how you knew Jackie. We started uh, working together at uh, the Metropolitan store. We had to walk over the 401 overpass to get to the closest city bus stop. Okay. I knew that if I was aggressive in my questioning, that she would probably shut down the same as she did with Ann English. Now, what do you remember about the night she went missing? I wasn't with her the night she went missing. But she gave me a call sometime after 1 o'clock in the afternoon to ask me if I would go with these two men that she knew. I said I wouldn't, and I warned her about going with them. I know who they are. Who are they? I can't. In the weeks after Jackie's murder, a security guard downtown found you with a photo in your pocket of Jackie. I was, took an overdose myself. But you were found with a, Jackie's photo in your pocket and there was an inscription on the back stating something like, oh. I knew who killed Jackie English. And you take it to your grave. Who's that? I was a big confidant back there. I never broke a secret. If someone told me something and, and asked me not to tell anybody, I wouldn't tell anybody. It's always frustrating when a witness clams up and won't fork over the information needed to help break a case open. Sometimes it's because they're genuinely afraid. Sometimes it's because they think they're being loyal to some confidant. It's important that I find another method of discovering who exactly she's protecting. Did your relative know Jackie? Not very well. Had they met before? I don't know. Did he ever come to visit you at the store? Might he? No. Have... No? 19 <laughs> stabbed a small child. Let's just cut no, to the chase. No, that stabbed a small child. Okay. And I went to the jail and asked him why he was taking the, 
the rap? The rap, and he said he didn't think would survive uh, delinquency school. So when got out in 1969? Okay, he got into trouble again, apparently. Right. And armed robbery, but I knew could never do that. So let me get this straight. He didn't stab the child, somebody else did, did. and this armed robbery, and he, he didn't do that either. No. But he but took the rap for both. He, well, he did. Okay. I've only ever told the truth as I remember it. Do you and still keep in touch with him? No, I don't know how where he's living or anything. I was too drugged up on psychiatric medication to uh, keep tabs on him. Over 40 years later, Marilyn Hurd is still protecting the identity of whoever it is she thinks killed Jackie English. The question is, is this an elaborate game she's playing, or has the trauma of Jackie's murder actually twisted her own memories to the point where she actually believes everything that she's saying and thinking? I'm also curious who they are. She keeps referring to them as they. Does this include Marilyn's relative and one or two or more other people or different people entirely? We need to focus on cold hard facts and move this case forward, not conjecture or guesswork or what Marilyn Hurd thinks she may know. Renee and I have been working on a geographic profile for Jackie, plotting locations where she was last seen, where her body was discovered, and where her clothing was found. Meanwhile, Danny has been looking into similar crimes with comparable signatures to combine into our geographic profile. Our hope is that by cross-referencing all locations, we are able to pinpoint where the killer most likely lived. So I sent you guys the spreadsheet on the London sex slings. Is there anything that you guys found in terms of patterns or commonalities? There was one case. Right. Um, it occurred in 19... If you guys want to take a look at... The case bears some remarkable similarities to Jackie. So was last seen getting into a car. Her body, her clothes, and her shoes were all found scattered widely. Wow. And the most obvious similarity is that evidence from the case was found near the same gravel pit where Jackie's shoes were left. The MO, uh, the age, and, and uh, circumstances. Many commonalities reduced. between these two cases. Yeah. And even though it was solved, the conviction didn't occur until 1970. So the timeline also fits uh, mm -hmm. for Jackie's case. Jackie was 69, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Are they still in jail? Were they free? It's kind of like an adrenaline rush, just realizing those connections. What's just... this guy's name? David. Renee's fine with respect to this David character. I mean, this is really what this initiative is about. This is what open source investigations uh, ideally yield, which is a match between where Jackie's shoes were dumped and where David's victim was also dumped. That can't be dismissed as a coincidence. Peter, how'd you make out with Rosmo's formula in your geographic profile? Pretty well. So let me just throw this up on the smart board here. Rosmo's formula is a mathematical equation designed to determine where a serial killer lives. If we assume that one serial killer was responsible for Jackie's murder, as well as the other murders in the same place and time that we've discovered, then Rosmo's formula allows us to pool the locations of these multiple murders and more accurately determine where the serial killer lives. So we've got place last seen for Jacqueline English, the various locations where her clothing was found, where her body was located. We've got the location of the attack on witness Betty Harrison. We've got home address at the time. All of this seems to be surrounding this red center. Explain right. the significance of that. So here overlaid on the map of London and surrounding towns is the most likely location of who killed Jackie English. The highest probability is marked by this red oval. And this red oval is centered on the town of Ontario. David lived in the same town. And the formula indicates that in the Jackie English case, that town is the most likely home base for the killer. So we're going to need to tighten this up. We've still got a lot of work to do. We still need to determine if we should be looking at Ireland's relative as potentially being involved in Jackie's murder. But it's also important to take a hard look at this David find out what involvement he might have had. It's time to start nailing this case down. The civilian squad has done a fantastic job unearthing new information about the unsolved murder of Jackie English. Already at this point in our investigation, we have several persons of interest. As it turns out, Jackie's co-worker, Marilyn Hurd, had a relative who was convicted of a serious assault just prior to Jackie's murder. 
but it's also important to take a hard look at this David fellow. Find out what he was up to. Find out what involvement he might have had. Thus far, the information is pretty compelling. And this red oval is centered on the town of Ontario. That town is the most likely home base for the killer. It's time to start nailing this case down. Right now, we have two persons of interest in this case. We also have a composite drawing of someone that a witness saw Jackie talking to the night she went missing. So I'm at Brock University to meet with a researcher who specializes in facial perception. I'm hoping to see whether the composite drawing resembles either of our persons of interest. The problem with his face, as you can see, is that it's, it's incredibly grainy. And so that makes it quite difficult to find some of the edges. This is a picture of David David's image is quite good. He's looking straight, straight ahead. On. So can you perhaps explain to me how you're going to compare these images to each other? I'll try to identify ways in which this composite is distinctive by comparing them to an average face. This is the Caucasian average. So we'll find out how it differs. Then what we'll do is we'll do some measurements on David's face and on face and see whether they differ in the same way or the opposite way. Now, if we look at uh, he only shares distinctive features um, in two ways. What's really interesting about his face is his forehead is particularly large. It's so much larger than average that I would consider that to be a fairly important difference. You can see that David does have a small forehead. And if we go from the brow to the middle of the lips, it's also larger. So in other words, just like the composite, the middle of his face seems to be relatively large. He seems to have a smallish chin. Where I have little green check marks, that indicates that he differs from the average face in the same way as that composite drawing. David has four green check marks um, compared to having only two, which means David is more similar to the composite. It's not a positive ID, but it's saying it could be. We just have to be careful to what extent we take these results because the sketch was not necessarily Jackie's murderer. I've worked a lot of weird cases in my day. Jackie English's case is probably the most twisted I've ever encountered personally. So who are we left with? Renee, I'm gonna go to you first. Well, I went to Brock University to meet with Dr. Kathy Mondlock. She was able to establish that the sketch could be of David and it is less likely to be that of our other person of interest, but it doesn't mean that David is the person who was the basis for the sketch. Peter, I'm gonna to come to you with respect to the Forensic Geographic profile. I re-ran it to see, without any prior assumptions of who killed Jackie, what does the geographic profile algorithm tell us? And sure enough, like before, lights right up, and the geographic profile prioritizes David over all our persons of interest. Along with Peter's geographic profile, we know from news reports from that period that this David character was convicted of dumping his victim's body just north of his hometown. Three years later, Jackie English's penny loafers turn up just a few meters away. This is not a coincidence. Dania, with respect to our second person of interest, what were you able to find out? He was convicted and sentenced to prison for three years. In 1970, a year after Jackie's murder, he abducted, attacked, and confined a female in her car. She did escape by rolling out of the moving vehicle. Eerily similar in MO to what happened in Jackie's case. And the question is, what happened to him after that? We were able to confirm that this person is currently living in Scotland. However, we don't know exactly where he is. Searching for him, doing whatever I possibly could, I could not get anything. Marilyn's relative is a ghost. Monty? Well, David is not a ghost. Uh, I found him. He was fully paroled and released from prison in 1980 after serving 10 years for non-capital murder. He's moved around quite a bit over the last 40 years, but uh, he's out there. In six weeks, given the age of this case, we've made remarkable progress to narrow down our list of suspects without ruling out the second person need to prioritize David as the prime suspect. The squad can take this case no further, and the police have received a copy of our research and analysis. We 
identified five people of interest in this investigation. And we're now down to two. One is Marilyn's relative. Yes. And the second is a person named David Let's talk about Marilyn's relative first. Okay. You said Jackie would never get in a car with someone she didn't know. Yes. They had met at least once or twice. Yes. So Jackie would presumably get in the car with him. In 1970, he abducted another woman and held her in a car by her throat until she jumped out of a moving car and escaped with her life. He was then jailed for three years and has since moved to Scotland. You can't rule out his earlier behavior, his predictors, as being you know, good indicators of what he was capable of. So the next thing we did was we conducted what's called the geographic profile. It was deemed highly accurate in terms of pinpointing an offender's probable home base. Our geographic profile of all places in the world points to Ontario. In 1960, David lived in In 1960, he had already killed This can't be dismissed as a coincidence. No. Statistically, all of these factors in total point to him slightly more than Marilyn's relative. Again, we yes. can't rule out either one. Is he still in jail? He's not. Oh. But we know where he is. In fact, he is alive and out there will put this case very much back into the public interest. We left no stone unturned. We did everything we possibly could. I'm just finally happy that we have a suspect. I was apprehensive before coming in, but now I'm excited because it is an opening to an answer. Life is cruel because the older you get, the more you tend to miss someone because you realize you should have a sister or you should have nieces and nephews. She should have been here. She should have been part of our lives. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mary. Very much. Our pleasure. Thank you, Angela.